So tonight we're going to be um, studying all of chapter 6 of Jeremiah. And there's kind of a theme going on here um, as, you know, the first five chapters had a little bit more of a, in my opinion, less intense kind of feel to them. But in chapter 6, things kind of escalate where it's like um, they're more um, hard-hearted about it and he's more kind of... Um, <sighs> Talking, giving prophecies that are more talking about um, kind of like the inevitability of it and how harsh it's going to be. So kind of a theme of chapter 7, and, and to, or I'm sorry, chapter 6 in total is the more you get into sin, the harder you get and the less you listen. That's kind of like a theme of it. So I'll break that down. You get into sin more and more. So then you get hard in your heart. You get where you don't listen to God, where you don't, you, you just, you, you're, you're an uncaring person, you're a mean person, you're, 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 you know, immoral, you're, you're doing bad things. Because you want to sin, you want to live in the sin, but you don't have to, like. Right. And so the more you do that, the harder it makes you, and then the less you listen. So um, let's say, for instance, um, a husband cheats on his wife. One time he feels super, super guilty about it. And so somebody tells him and says, hey, you cheated on your wife. That that that's not good, and he's like, oh no, yeah, you're right, I did, I shouldn't have, you know. And he's kind of more repentant of it. What happens if he does it over and over and over again? Well, he gets more hard hearted, hard hearted about it, and then when you say, hey, you need to stop doing that, well, now he's not really going to listen. So I mean, so the more you get into sin, the more your heart gets hard, and the less you listen. And that's kind of what's happening in Jeremiah. Is Jeremiah is giving these words, and they're just straight up not listening. So uh, Jeremiah basically has, I mean, chapter six basically has four uh, prophecies to them. Um, as I count them, I, I might be wrong. Some other people broke them up differently than I did, so I, I don't know. I might be wrong, but um, all four of these prophecies date, uh, you know, uh, er, sometime early in Jeremiah's ministry, probably around the same time as as the ones we've looked at so far in Jeremiah, so before 609 BC. Um, and but it's kind of hard to find out which pro what um, what parts are individual prophecies. Uh, that's actually something that um, not a whole lot of my books reference, and uh, evidently some of the some of the books I have they give a couple different possible dates um, for, uh, I mean, a possible breakups of the chapters into prophecies. It's just, it's, it seems like they don't really know. So we'll start off in verse one. Eli, you want to read that? Mm -hmm. Run for cover out of Jerusalem, Benjamites. Uh, Benjaminites. Benjaminites. Sound the ram's horn and cheat. Tekoa. Tekoa. Raise a, <laughs> raise a smoke signal over Beth. Hekrem? Oh. Sure. Hekrem? That's fine. Her disaster <laughs> threatens from the north. Even a crushing blow, though it, she is beautiful and delicate, I will just destroy daughters Zion. Shepherds and their flock will come against her. They will pitch their tents all around her. Each will pasture his own portion. Set them apart for wars against her. Rise up, let's attack at noon. Woe to us, for the day is passing. The evening shadows still along. So this is the first of the four prophecies. Um, and it's kind of, I, I don't know if you'd call, say ironic, but the last uh, chapter, that the, the last verse of the last chapter that we looked at last week said this. My people love to be deceived, but what will they do at the end of it? And then it leads right into the beginning of this one where it says, run for cover out of Jerusalem, Benjamites. So I just think that that's, that's kind of funny. But um, though Judah and Israel would have would have a remnant, this prophecy makes it absolutely clear that the city of Jerusalem itself would be destroyed. Even though the, the – so before he's, he's talking about, I will spare a remnant of you, I will spare – well, this time he's not really talking about that because he's talking about daughter Zion, which is um, Jerusalem. It's going to be completely destroyed. And uh, it would be rebuilt 70 years later, as recorded in Ezra and Nehemiah, but um, it would still be destroyed. Um, now, if you notice, he uses a metaphor here. He says, um, she is beautiful and delicate. I will destroy shepherds and their flocks. Who's the shepherds and the flocks? It's the leaders and their armies. Um, it, it, it's, it's a metaphor for the different uh, military leaders and their armies that are coming to lay siege against it. And uh, so it says there, uh, pasture. Um, they will pitch the pitch uh, to tents all around her. Each will pasture his own portion. What that means is they will each have their own part to play. All, all the different leaders in the armies will each do their own part in destroying the city. Um, and it says here, set them apart for war against her. The, the, the word that's used there is um, kind of like sanctify. So he's talking about sanctify the, 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 the invading army. And the idea here is that this is a holy war. God is literally calling a holy war against 
Jerusalem. Which, you know, that's never a good thing. When God's calling a holy war against somebody and you're that somebody. Mm -hmm. Like, back in the books of the law, if you remember, like, it was, oh, let's slaughter the Canaanites. And it was, oh, we're all good with this because we're the victors. But at this time, it's the tables have turned. And this is exactly what was said when... Um, when God led Israel to into the holy war against Canaan, is there was that that warning that it would come on them if they didn't listen. And so just the same as he'd been patient with Canaan, but then brought punishment. Now he was patient with them and brought punishment. And uh, so we can see kind of a a, rever a, re a role of reversal. Gee whiz. Um, and then it says here, woe to us for the day is passing. Who's saying woe to us? Not Israel. The person saying woe to us is actually um, the armies that are against going against Jerusalem. They're saying woe to us because they were so excited for the war that stopping for night was undesirable. So so they, they went to war against Jerusalem in the day night was approaching, and they're saying, oh, no, we have to stop attacking. So then they say, um, on the, in the very next verse, they say, uh, rise up, let's attack by night. So, Gracie, can you read that? Mm -hmm. Rise up, let's attack by night. Let's destroy the, her fortress. For this is what the Lord of armies says. Cut down the trees, raise the sea ramp against the against Jerusalem. This city must be punished. There is nothing but oppression within her. As a, as a well gushes out its water, so she pours out her evil. Violence and destruction resound to her. Sickness and, and wounds coming to her, to my attention. Be warned, Jerusalem, or I will return, or I will turn away from you. I will make you a desolation, um, a land without inhabitants. A desolation is basically like a, an emptiness, a, a, a destroyed field, kind of. Um, so, obviously, you know, they're, they, they don't want to attack, so then, excuse me, so then this verse uh, leads into that they're just attack at night. Um, so, uh, Let's see, where is the part there? Be warned, Jerusalem, there on the uh, there towards the end, um, or I will turn away from you. And so the idea here is the coming punishment might actually be worse than it was already going to be. If they didn't repent, the coming punishment might actually become worse than what it's already going to be. See, we have in our idea that, that it was like this. They sinned, so God was going to bring punishment. That was that. But that's not what he said. He said, okay, depending on your level of uh, response to what's happening will depend on the level of punishment that you get. So basically, we're talking about less people surviving uh, the, 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 um, the, the attack. Um, so it, not we are fated to die, so there's nothing we can do, but you know, there is still something you can do. You can still repent and make it, make it lighter. Um, it's like this. You're um, getting ready to give your kid a spanking. And uh, they're yelling at you, I hate you. Well, yeah, I'm not actually cutting down any of your spankings. <laughs> Let's amp this thing up. Um, even in God's <laughs> even in God's punishment, there was mercy. Even though the punishment was so harsh, there was still mercy. So he could potentially have the destruction uh, continue in, in, in how many of the people survived. Uh, and some punishment was definite. How much, though, was still open? So it, it's kind of one of those things where even when God brings by punishment, if you turn to him and repent, there's a chance that it won't be as bad as it would have been. So, uh, Eli, can you read this one? Mm -hmm. This is what the Lord of Armies says. Gl glean, gl mm -hmm. glean. Gl glean the remnant, remnant of Israel as thoroughly as a vine. Pass your hand once more like a grape gatherer over the branches. Who can I speak to and give such a warning that they will listen? Look their ears uncircumcised so they c cannot pay attention. See the w word of the Lord has become con contem contemptible to, to them. They, they find no pleasure in it, but I am full of the Lord's wrath. I am tired of holding it back. Pour it on the children in the street, on the gathering of the young men as well. So this takes us to the second prophecy. Now it says they're glean. It starts out the prophecy like that. And if you like most modern people, what is going on there? What does it mean to glean? So uh, glean is a term used for, for 
you know, so you, you had this machine, or well, now back then you didn't have a machine. You'd have people go and they would they would collect the, the, the grain. And then there'd be some that was left on the ground. So to glean would be to go where you go back over the fields and you pick up what was left over from the people who collected. Um, and uh, the interesting things here is it says that to glean the remnant of Israel. So we're talking about after the harvest or after Israel has been punished, go back and glean the remnant of Israel. And then he says, as thoroughly as a vine. So it's easier to see, for instance, a purple grape on a vine than it is to see a bushel on the ground. <laughs> or not a bushel, but a piece of, of wheat on the ground. And then it says, pass your hand once more like a grape gatherer. So he's not, he's not talking about just the punishment coming or gleaning after the punishment. He's talking about gleaning twice and uh, make sure nothing is left behind. We're talking about punishment on punishment for Israel. It's a punishment after punishment. Uh, is, a, is a way you could say that. And then it says here, look, their ear is uncircumcised. What does that mean? A, a circumcision is where you cut off the foreskin of the, of the penis. What, what is this talking about? Well, an uncircumcised ear is an unbelieving ear. So uh, this is where you hear, but you don't believe God's word. Maybe somebody reads it, you know, ah, whatever. I, that's not really going to apply to my life. And you just kind of move on with, you, with your day. That would be an uncircumcised ear. Um, so when he says here, uh, look, their ear is uncircumcised, so they, can, they cannot pay attention. They have unbelieving ears. They have got atheist ears, is, is how you could say it nowadays. Um, so, you know, they make fun of the Bible, doing nothing to obey, unconcerned with the things of God. That would be a good example of, of having uncircumcised ears. Uh, and it says here, I am full of the wrath. Uh, I am full of the Lord's wrath. They're on the third line from the bottom. And when I, how I used to read this is, is I thought he was saying, I'm so overcome with wrath that I just want to see you all die. But that's not that's not what he's saying. If you actually look at what he's saying, not I am angry, but God has communicated clearly to his prophet his anger at sin. See, I am full of the Lord's wrath, not I am wrathful. The Lord has communicated his wrath to me, and I am filled with it. Like I, I have, I he has communicated his displeasure. The culture should, and uh, before I go on with that, let me just say this. The culture around us should bother us. There's an element of how Christians should be suffering in the midst of a wicked culture. If we look at the culture around us and call it good, that's a clear indication that God is still, um, still has a lot of work to do in our hearts. When, when there's children being mass murdered all around us on abortions, when there's, you know, disobedience rampant, everybody's lying, um, all the arrogance, man, look at how, how evil our city is and how people around us, everybody's doing the wrong thing. There's drug addicts here, drug addicts there, everybody's beating their kids and going to jail and all this stuff. Even the government agencies, the, you know, the CYFD and stuff that's supposed to be helping these people, even they are doing the wrong thing. You know, the, 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 when the police are corrupt, when everybody's corrupt, it's like you see it all around us. That should bother us. Not to the extent that we, you know, take up Facebook rants, but that we, 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 with humility, endure the suffering of living in an evil culture. That's what Christians are called to do. And uh, the arrogance of people and whatnot. So it says here, I am tired of holding it back. So Jeremiah, God communicates his wrath to Jeremiah. And he understands it, and then he's been trying to hold it back. He's, he doesn't want to give these harsh words. He, he, he's trying to, like, he's not looking forward to this. But, obviously, God went out because he, he gave the word. Uh, I, I am full of the Lord's wrath. I'm tired of holding it back. I can't fight this anymore. I, I got to give, give this word. So, pour it out on the children on the street. And uh, the idea here is, um, just a second. Um, and, and the idea here is it, it's it's pretty harsh. And so if we look at this um, in our um, in our day and age, this is what we do. We're removed from the situation, and we lean on our own understanding, and we say, we use it as an excuse and say, it wasn't that bad. That punishment punishment is too harsh. Punishment on children? Like, geez, calm down. But the thing is, once again, we're, we're removed from the situation. We're we're going at it, looking at it, leaning on our own understanding, and then giving it excuses and saying it wasn't that bad, and that the punishment is too harsh. But it's what God said. Like God's word oftentimes bothers us. That's that's okay. Like for instance, it's normal for guys to want to sleep with every girl. That's a normal part of being a human. It's not okay, but it's a normal part of being a man. M men think like that it, it, you can't allow what's normal to allow what's moral but um you know you've got this thing that, that that's a normal event and 
God says things that rubs us the wrong way because it limits our it limits our freedom. It limits what we can do. And so we want to live life on our own terms. I want to do the good things that I want, and I want the bad things that I want to not happen. But God has kind of his own standards, and when he says things, it should bother us because our standards are not his. And when it bothers us, this is, you can do two th- one or two things when God's word bothers you. Number one, um, tell him that he's wrong. Fight him on it. Uh, you know, get arrogant and, and, and no, the Bible's wrong. I'm just not, no. Or you can submit to it and say, what do I have to learn from this? So the lesson to learn from this is that God, that, that when we sin, it it brings God's wrath on us, but it also brings punishment on others too. It brings punishment on let on, on the younger people. We we have to act wisely, not just for ourselves, but for our children. Um, and, uh, you know, the thing is that this word bothered Jeremiah too. He, he just said how he, he was trying to hold it back. He didn't want... He didn't. He didn't. He wasn't enjoying this. He wasn't like, oh, huzzah! You know, this is something he's not having a good time with, and so it bothered him too. But God's wrath is against sinfulness, which is why we must turn to Jesus. This is why we need Jesus in our lives. This is why. Was God justified in commanding the death of the young and the old? Before I answer that, what do you guys think? Was God justified in bringing about the death of the young and the old? Okay. They still didn't listen after how many years? <laughs> you know? Yep. So I feel like, yeah, it was justified. Okay. Were you going to say anything? Oh, go ahead. Also, I feel like it's not our place to judge God's things because, I mean, he's God. We're, we're not his judge. He's our judge. Exactly. Exactly. And that is, is the point. We go to God as though we are the judge. God, is, is, is it right for you to do that? And that's what a lot of the problem is. See, the Bible talks about people who don't believe in God, that they've got ears, they've, they've, got, they've got a veil over their face. They've got, they've got the gospel is, is hidden from them. And so they, they go over a passage like this, and they can't see, the, they can't see the, the meaning of it, the importance of it, the gravity of sin. And a lot of the new Christian teachers, they don't talk about the gravity of sin anymore. They talk, it's all about just being a good person and, you know, more of, physical life and everything it's not about the eternal things um but what what god talks about is often going to be things that we don't like but it's not our place whether to like it or to not like it it's our place to obey and listen and that's really the 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 defining line there The, the maker decides how the vessel is used and he also decides check it out how long the vessel is used we are the vessel so it doesn't matter if we die when we're one year old or when we're a hundred years old god made us so we are his vessel and he decides how long that vessel gets to be used for we don't have any control of that you can eat healthy go go to the gym every day you know uh you can do all these different things bike to work every day like make it make your life about being fit and healthy and you could still die before you even hit 20. like that's just a fact of life either things that are out of your control like cancer or or you know sickness or that kind of stuff or things that were in your in your in your power, like maybe you thought it'd be fun to skydive without a parachute on. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> sin cuts down blessings, and it affects the lives of those around us, like our children. And so, rather than rather than listening to this, they wanted to live the life on their own terms. And then when bad things happen, then they want to be God's judge. And that's exactly the same thing that still happens today. People don't want to read the Bible, and then when they read something like this, oh, well, that's not fair. I don't like that. And, you know, God's this big old meanie that he's just a big old jerk in the sky. And then when punishment comes, it's like, well, that's not fair. And it's like, who do you think you are? Like, we're talking about the one who made the universe. We're not on the same platform here. And that's one of the things that I think is a real indicator that the Bible is true because it's something that the brain doesn't like and doesn't it's not, it doesn't come natural to, to submit to somebody else's standard that's so foreign to our own. Um, so who read last time? Was it you? It was you? Eli, can you read this? For both husband and wife will be captured. The old with the very old, their houses will be turned over to others, their fields and wives as well. For I will, I will stretch my out my hand against the inhabitant of the land. This is the Lord's decor. Declaration. Declaration. <laughs> for, <laughs> for, for, for from the least to the greatest of men, everyone is making a profit dishonestly. From prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. 
They have treated my people's brokenness superficially, claiming peace, peace, when there is no peace. So his people despise his blessing, his reaching out his hand to bless them. So instead, here we have a reversal once again. This is We've been seeing these all over in Jeremiah, where he's reaching out his hand, hands again. Uh, 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 to, I'm sorry, let me say that again. His people despise his blessings, how he reached out his hand to help them. So now the opposite is happening, and he's reaching out their, their, his hand to hurt them. Their houses will be turned over to others. Um, let's see where, for I will stretch out my hand against the inhabitants of the land. So you stretched out to bless before, and now he's stretching out to, to curse. And so, you know, an interesting question, I think, gets across what's, what's being said in this verse. And so I'll just ask this. How would you feel if you went to the doctor and they told you all was well while you had kidney failure, cancer, and high blood pressure? How would you feel? Um, I'd be upset. <laughs> right? <laughs> By a show of hands, who would be excited to go back to that doctor, right? <laughs> and that's exactly what's happening. The prophets and the priests, and they're, they're, when it says they're, they're, done, they're treating my people's brokenness superficially. That's what he's talking about. He's, they're not really helping. And that takes us to this. And I'll read this part since it's a little bit of an odd one out. Were they ashamed when they acted so detestably? They weren't at all shamed, ashamed. They can no longer feel humi humi humiliation. <laughs> Therefore, they will fall among the fallen. When I punish them, they will collapse, says the Lord. They didn't even feel bad about it. Think about this. They didn't even feel bad about it. There's this idea around that, oh, you are enough. And that sentiment is just not true. They they wouldn't be strong enough. When when I punishment when I punish them, they will collapse, says the Lord. They are not going to be strong enough. That sentiment of oh you are enough. No, you aren't enough. You're not enough not only for salvation or to you know somehow earn your way to God, but you're also not enough to be able to stand through life and to and to be able to deal with life. That's why God gave us other people. That's why, you know, God needs to go with us is because what we are in our, of ourselves are not enough. We don't have all the answers. And like, like the words here says, when I punish them, they will collapse. We are not enough. Living in our own toxic bubble of self, uh, self, uh, self worship won't bring us satisfaction. It'll actually bring us to a place of when we collapse, there'll be nobody to pick us up and we definitely will collapse. So group question, is God's love toxic? If you don't love me, then I'll curse you. Is God's love toxic? Are you, are you asking? No. Yeah, it's a group question. Okay. What do you guys think? No, I don't think it's toxic, toxic, at all, toxic at all. Does it seem to you like he's kind of saying, if you don't love me, then I'll curse you? Like, love me or else. Well, I mm -hmm. well, he like he, he he gives us the option what's what's freedom like a free like free will yeah free will like to either follow him and you know like be discomfort or actually listen to him and actually mm -hmm. you know but it's like it's like being a parent like if your kid doesn't listen to you he'll obviously it's gonna be in trouble but if he does. He's probably going to get rewarded for listening. So right, yeah, that's actually a really good point because you know you 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 brought up the thing about um, how you know it's like with a parent. So a parent doesn't stop loving their child when they're punishing them mm -hmm. or when they're doing the bad thing. Yeah. So good point. Were you going to say anything? No, um, I think the people that think that are the people that don't truly have experienced God's love before. I think they're people that just have an idea of enough knowledge of the Bible to be dangerous and I feel like if they would experience God's love for what it really is I feel like they wouldn't think that anymore hmm. well I mean I, I'm not going to disagree with you but there is a point when some people sometimes people who have been saved for a long time just kind of reach a plateau and they go through a lot of hurts and they can come up with things like this too it's not just people who have never noticed people who have been overworked and just under uh, didn't have a devotional life maybe they forgot about and they just kind of forget yeah and the word the was the, the jesus said the, the worries of the life choke out the faith mm -hmm. um 
here's I'm just gonna there's there's a few ideas that I had in response to this idea of is God's love toxic. The first is that God isn't a lover; He is the moral judge. You know, He's not a girlfriend; he, He's the moral judge. He He loves us past a feeling. So, like what we do is we love somebody with a feeling. When the feeling is gone, we see that we're falling out of love with them. Whatever that means. Love is an action. It's not something that you can just fall out of love with somebody. The way you fall out of love with somebody is if you stop loving them. So he loves us past a feeling. It's not about a feeling for God. He and here, Here's another thing. Guys love like this. When, when they say, a lot of times when they say, I love, what they mean to say is, I am sexually aroused by. See what I mean? They don't actually love. They've just got feelings because that girl's hot. God doesn't work like this. He loves us and where he genuinely cares and sacrifices of himself for us. So he loves us past just a feeling like we love. And he doesn't punish us from scorn. You know, like when you get mad and you're just like, you're just wishing some evil on somebody. God doesn't punish us with scorn, from scorn. He punish, uh, He will get angry and he will punish us in his anger, yes. But when he gets anger, angry, he doesn't like change you know what I mean? Like, have you seen, noticed how when people get angry, their countenance changes, their their expression on their face changes, their, their attitude changes? God doesn't really do that. If you could see his face, it'd be like the same face. You know what I mean? He doesn't like uh, like the Hulk, you know, morph into some green monster or something like that. He, and he So he doesn't punish us from scorn. He punishes us from his perfect character. And he punishes the guilty because he is righteous. That's, that's, that's who he is. God's love is selfless. But... His justice is constant. So God's got justice and he's got love. His love okay, is selfless, but his justice is constant. He's not going to become unjust because I love you so much that I'm just going to ignore your immorality. That, that doesn't work. His love isn't made less by his wrath and justice. They complement each other. So think of, think of, for instance, Jesus. Okay, He comes to earth, he, he, he lives, he dies. Okay? Jesus died for the sake of justice. It was the right thing because we were sinners who deserved to be punished. Okay, so for the sake of justice. And he did it to appease God's wrath against sin. Okay, okay. But he took the punishment on himself because he's loving. That's a good example of how it all just is married together. Jesus had to die not just for the sake of love, but also for the sake of justice. Paul even says that that he had to come in order, basically, in order to prove what he said in the Old Testament was true. He had to prove himself because a promise unfulfilled is a lie. <laughs> so God had to prove himself in in a way, not to prove. No, I should say that differently. When I say prove himself, sometimes we have this idea of prove it. Well, that's not what I mean at all. So um, his love, God's love, was trying to warn Israel. Turning Israel into an example for others. Okay, so let's, let's, I'm going to have to say this in a different way. God's love was trying to warn Israel. They wouldn't listen. He kept on trying to, trying to warn them, even though he was bringing punishment. Because his justice demanded the punishment, he was still trying to warn them. God's love was turning Israel into an example for others. For instance, us. God's love was punishing because he loves us so we can grow. The only way we'll, we'll learn is if we experience Consequences for actions. Some pe some parents think that they're doing their kids favors by not giving spankings, by not giving any kind of punishment whatsoever, corporal corporal punishment or whatever. And the thing is, that's you're not doing them any favors. You're setting them up for failure. You're showing them there are no consequences for their actions. You're showing them that there's no purpose of, of doing better. You're you're showing them that that kind of behavior is acceptable. You're, you're teaching them bad things. Kids are always listen, learning and listening, and you're teaching them bad things. But God's love in his punishment is, is, is he's focusing on us growing. Now, it's our choice. We can harden our hearts instead of growing. That's up to us, but he will still do it. Like, for instance, you teach your children. Will they always listen? No. But you're not responsible for the reaction. You're responsible for, as a parent for teaching your child. Now, that's exactly God is responsible for doing what God does. That's who he is. It's not his fault if we harden ourselves. Well, God, why did you punish them if you knew that they wouldn't repent? It doesn't matter if they repent or not. God is just. He will bring justice. That's how it works. Um, so uh, God's love brings blessings. He, he desires to, to bring things by for us. He desires to, to, to heal us and to bless us. 
And uh, and God's love also looks for opportunities for mercy. He looks for the opportunity he can he can say, you know what, it's all good. We're just gonna move on. And a lot of times in the Old Testament, he actually did that, just letting things go. That you know, take for instance, you know, all the immoral things that people did in the Old Testament. How Abraham married his sister. That's something God didn't want her to do. He did it though. And then later, God gave a law and said, hey, yeah, by the way, don't don't do that. Um, when uh, when King David's son raped his ra- raped his daughter, that was something that God didn't want to happen. But did God exact re- vengeance? No. There's a lot of things that, that God just kind of let it go for the time being. Not to say that the sin was unpunished. There is a next life, for instance. But that he didn't bring an immediate retaliation, if you will. So God's love requires consequences. If we love, we also must lose. That's that's a that's a part of life. It, it's the same. It, it, it's it's the same coin. Okay. If you love someone, your love will not be eternal. Eventually, one of you will die. Loss. It's the same coin. Just two different sides of the same coin. Love is pregnant with loss. It's just how it how it works. And um, you could say this, we will all die one day anyways in life. We will all die one day. But we can give ourselves up for others, which is true love. And as we can love ourselves, we can love others. So I think that, that uh, th- that's my opinions on the whole is God's love toxic thing. I think that it just comes from a, a complete misunderstanding of, of God and of the situation, which I think is basically what you said too. I just elaborated a little bit more. Uh, whose turn? Is it here? Okay. And this is what the Lord said: Stand by the roadway and look. Ask about the ancient path. Path. Um, which is the way to what is good? Then take it and find rest for yourself. But they uh, protested, "We won't." I appointed watchmen over you and said, listen for the sound of the ram's horn. But they protested, we won't listen. Therefore, listen, you nations, and you witness, learn what the change, a charge is against them. Listen, earth, I am about to bring disaster on these people, the fruit of their own plotting, for they have paid no attention to my words. They have rejected my so now we get to the third prophecy, and as is really all throughout Jeremiah, there's a, there's a lot of this that, that um, sounds very similar to other prophecies. Specifically, uh, Isaiah says something almost verbatim to what's said here. Um, and, and the thing is, we all want rest, right? I mean, who, who doesn't want rest for their soul? Especially the older you get, you, there's like this longing in your inner soul, and you desire that you know that 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 peace it's why we always try and recapture lost love right we have our first love and we have those the feels in our heart and it, oh, it makes us feel all whatever and we always try it through the rest of our life to try and recapture that feeling or you know how we how we felt when we got out of college how we had the whole world before us and we try to recapture that and ecclesiastes puts it like this it's not wise to ask to, to, to talk about the good old days it's just not wise and uh, so we all want that rest rest it's something deep inside of us and but we always look for it in the wrong places. We look for it in pleasure or fun or entertainment, and it never, it never does. Like oh, if I just have sex with one more girl, then you know. But it doesn't. You know we are, oh this is somehow gonna bring rest to my weary soul, and it doesn't. So but here we have God instead saying, hey, okay, um, here's the way to the ancient past. They can find rest for themselves. The ancient past, that's talking about the ways that God revealed to their ancestors in Deuteronomy. This is the ancient past, what was revealed to the people of Israel when they brought out, out of Egypt. Okay, um, But they didn't want to listen to that. So I said, okay, um, uh, I pointed watchmen over you and said, listen for the sound of the ram's horn. And the watchmen are prophets uh, who are giving warning that they're just not listening to. So since they wouldn't listen, he told the witnesses instead. He says, um, uh, therefore, listen, you nations and, and you and you witnesses. Um, and who are those? Who are these witnesses that he's talking about? He's talking about creation and the nations. These are the witnesses that he's now calling against them, since they won't listen themselves. Think of you're in court, okay, and you're trying to talk to this person, and 
Okay, so this is the charge against you, and they just won't listen. So you're saying, okay, listen, jurors and uh, uh, people who are just sitting in the back, uh, listen to what I'm going to say because they're not listening. It is basically think of something similar to that. Um, and uh, when he, it's funny that when he talks about the watchman here, um, I appointed watchman over you because Ezekiel says in one of his prophecies um, that he is a watchman who's been appointed by God. And Ezekiel is um, after Jeremiah. So, Eli, you want to read that? What use to me is frankincense from, not frankincense, from Sheba or sweet cane from a distant land? Their burnt offerings are not acceptable. Their sacrifices do not please me. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. I'm going to place stumbling blocks before these people, fa fathers and sons together will stumble at both of them. Friends and neighbors will also perish. So, this answers a hypothetical retort that Israel might have had in response to what God is saying here. We have offered sacrifices, God. We follow the law. And his answer is basically to obey is better than sacrifice. What use to me is your frankincense from Sheba or your sweet cane from a distant land? What, what, what use to me is this offering, the sacrifices you're bringing to me when you're not obeying me? That's basically the same thing. Um, what, so what are some stumbling blocks God might place? Do you guys have any ideas? It says here, fathers and sons together will stumble over them. What are some of these stumbling blocks? I'm going to play stumbling blocks. What are some of these? You guys got any ideas? What a stumbling block is that might, God might bring by? Punishment for a family? Or for... Any stumbling block. Like trouble or uh, war or something like that. Okay. You said war, you said trouble. And let's see. Uh, something that, like in the family, like something okay. wrong with family, home. Okay, like what do you mean by something wrong with family? Like, like let's, I don't know, let's say, like, uh, I don't know. like you just guys just don't get along and then you guys start to fall apart, the family starts to fall apart, and like in other things. And so just disunity as a whole? Yeah. Okay, makes sense. Guess you got anything? Things that happen with the different generations. Okay. You know, like same father, then sons together will stumble over them. So, what so are you like, thinking? For instance, when we were kids, the big thing was um, talking about the uh, end times and people going to hell. And now the big thing is um, making unity with everybody and, and everybody um, um, is the existing and stuff like that and, then, and so with each new generation uh, uh, there's things that you stumble <coughs> over because um, sometimes it doesn't line up with the Bible and um, it, the different generations don't agree with each other hmm. yeah um, so some things that I wrote down financial difficulties famine and drought war uh, work difficulties health problems people who irritate you and then here we've got this. So I think it's uh, crazy. Uh, this is what the Lord says. To look at an, uh, look, an army is coming from a northern land. A great nation will be stir, um, stirred up from the remote regions of the earth. They grasp, bu uh, they grasp bow and javelin. Javelin. Um, they are cruel and show no mercy. Their voice roars like the sea. And they ride on horses lined up alike men in battle formations against you daughter zion we have heard from about it and our hands have become weak disaster has seized us pain like a woman in labor so this brings us to a fourth prophecy and it's mostly um mostly pretty clear uh there's really no reason to elaborate too much on this section but it says here um about the hands where did that Go right here. We have heard about it. This uh, second line from the bottom. We have heard about it, and our hands have become weak. Uh, that that's the saying. Our hands have become weak. Kind of like uh, we've lost courage. We've become terrified. Um, so like you know when you get really really scared and you feel kind of weak. It's kind of that. So, um, but I mean I think the rest of this kind of just makes sense. You know there's these people attacking. You know, kind of scary. Okay. Any no questions on that, right? No. No. Okay. Uh, Eli, want to read that? Don't go out to the field, don't walk on the road, for the enemy has a sword, terror is on every side. 
My dear people, dress yourselves in sackcloth and roll, roll in the dust. Mourn as you would for an only son, a bitter lament, lament, for lament, s- lament, for su- suddenly to destroy your weak home manner. A lament is like a sad, um, a sad cry or a sad song. Um, if you're lamenting the past, it would be that you are more, you are crying over the past. You're you're maybe ri- writing a sad poem about it. What were you gonna say? Didn't you say like they, they wore like whatever that was like like mourning or like whenever there was like a, a drought happening or something like that? They'd wear they'd wear certain clothes or something. Is the sackcloth? Yeah. Yeah. No, okay. Yeah. When when like at a funeral they would wear sackcloth, or uh, to show humility. Uh, or if they um, were were shamed or, or anything like that, that that's that's kind of the, yeah. Um, so yes, it says there, dress yourself in sackcloth and roll in the dust. Basically, humble yourself, and uh, basically the advice of this section goes as follows: It isn't safe to go outside. You guys get back in the city, it's not safe to be going going outside. This is not the time to be having a pleasant Sunday afternoon stroll. Uh, humble yourself. And be moved with the reality of what's happening around you. This is this is real. This is happening. You, you need to be moved with this. And stop lying to yourself about the reality of this. And so that's basically what's that part right there just said. Um, okay. Right there. Okay. So uh, this is the last section of the of the chapter. I mean, yeah. Grace? I have appointed you um, to be a, a sailor among my people, a refiner. So you may know the sale, uh, say, um, their ways to life, of life. All are stubborn rebels, spreading slander. They are bronze and iron. All of them are corrupt. The bellows be- be- blow, um, blasting, and uh, the lead with fire. The refining is completely in vain. The evil ones are not separated out uh, they are called rejected silver for the lord has rejected them okay so there's a lot of words here that you guys probably are unfamiliar with the first one is a sayer i have appointed you being a sayer among my people and a sayer is someone who tests metal that's i know i know it's super simple but that's how it is it's someone who tests metal uh so the idea here is that jeremiah would test israel to see what was in them and then it says um a refiner um, so this is uh, to refine metal is where you take a metal and you uh, heat it up and you purify it. And the product when it's finished is pretty much the same. It's just that, excuse me, it's just that it doesn't have the impurities in it. I mean, you're left with this. It isn't like it changes what it is. It just makes it a pure metal, purer metal. So uh, to refine is to purify the metal by taking out the impurities. Um, and so he's talking about the way that this this punishment is God's way of. It's basically like this, okay? There are some churches who cannot be saved by a turnaround. Like so, a turnaround is where a pastor goes and he tries to just bring it back to a, a, a healthy place of growth. And there are some churches that that are just too far gone. So what do you do? The church is done away with. You start from the bare bare bottom and build it back up. That's exactly what's happening here with Israel. They, they were just too far gone. They were just too too little too late. Nothing that they could do would, would, would could, could fix what was happening. Um, even when people made attempts, it wasn't really fixing the heart of the issue. And so God brought Babylon by, uprooted them, brought the had them spend 70 years in exile, had them come back and start rebuilding the city from scratch and just built it up that way, and it worked. Um, they got so careful about following the law that the Pharisees were invented. <laughs> Mm, that's a joke. Uh, so then it says here, uh, all our stubborn rebels spreading slander. Okay, do 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 the bells blow. Where is it? Uh, oh, right here. So you may know and say their way of life. And the idea here of know is not just that. It's more of an understand or be aware of. Um, so they would be purified and tested, taking out the impurities of the evil. And it says here, the bellows blow. If you don't know what a bellow is, it's this giant blower that they have. Uh, for blacksmithing and fireworking, for working with metals, so they have like this. Looks like that. So uh, we have a small bellows. It's we just use it on the fireplace. Um, so the uh, there's actually two ways this, this could could be read. The evil ones are not separated out. It could read one of two ways. Number one, evil ones not separated out. So the evil people not spread taken out from the group, or 
evil is not separated out. So in other words, they are evil and the evil from them is not being taken out. Or there's some evil people among them and they're not being taken out. Um, so this is all pointless, though, because they weren't listening and learning. They continued to harden their hearts as God continued to work. So they were rejected metal, though precious. So I want you to notice this, okay? They're doing all this work, the sayer, and, and heating the bronze and all this different stuff. But then it says here, the evil ones are not separated out. They are called rejected silver. So they're doing all this work to try and to try and do something here, but it's all pointless. It doesn't. They don't listen. They don't learn. They continue to harden their, harden their hearts and... So what were they left as? They were rejected metal. Now, if you notice, he called this them rejected silver. Silver is precious, but it was rejected silver because it wasn't being purified. So he's not saying that Israel is, 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 is not precious. It's just that he's throwing away something that was precious. And then that makes it all the more heartbreaking. So then somebody might say, well, I thought God loves us. Well, here's the thing. He does, which is why he is refining us. It's our choice to get stubborn. So as we are stubborn, we make it worse and worse until we cross a line and God has to throw away something that he loves. So yes, he loves. And I heard a pastor say it once like this. There was a West Texas pastor. He got real deep when he said it. like this. God loves you all the way to hell. <laughs> he did that little... <laughs> but he had that bass rumble thing. You know how West Texas pastors are. Um, I thought God never abandoned his people. I thought, you know, that he would he, he doesn't just throw people away, that he would never abandon us. Here's the thing. He doesn't. They abandoned him. Our salvation is assured. What that means is that God doesn't lose us. Like, if we're saved, we, we are held in his hands. But that doesn't mean that we can't abandon him. The more you live in sin, the harder your heart gets to God, and he won't lose any of his people. He knows who are really his people. But... There are still those who uh, will fall away from our perspective. He knew that they would fall away, but we didn't know that they would fall away. Um, and so next week, guys, there is there is no yams. It is canceled. 